A couple of months ago now, you might remember we actually got a brand new Bleach chapter. It was something of a big deal and people were pretty excited by it. And I know a few of us really hoped that it would at least begin to answer some of the lingering questions we had left over from the end of the series in 2016. There was one question that Kubo actually answered right off the bat, and that was who had taken over the vacant positions of the vice captains in the Gote 13. And thankfully, in the new chapter, New Breathes from Hell, Kubo told us exactly who was filling those positions. And so in today's video, we're going to take a look at exactly that. Who are the new vice captains that make out the rest of the Gote 13? Before we begin, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now. You're in the perfect place for Bleach content like this every single week. And of course, if you enjoyed the video as well, make sure to give it a thumbs up. I really do appreciate the support and it helps get that video out to more Bleach fans like yourselves and gives it more exposure across YouTube. And if you do want to help support me a little bit further, we have a Patreon for the channel as well now where you can support me for as little as a dollar a month and you can get early access to videos just like this one. And a huge thank you goes out to every Everyone who is supporting me over on Patreon, I couldn't do this without you. So like I said, at the end of Bleach, we knew who every captain was. Obviously, certain captains were killed in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, and those spots had to be filled. And so we know, of course, characters like Isane and Iba took to new captain roles. But there were a few vice captain spots left over where we didn't know exactly who would take those positions. There were a couple of new vice captains revealed in Chapter 685, namely Ikaku and Kione Kotetsu. Um, but the rest of them, the vice captain of Squad 7, Squad 8, Squad 12, uh, and squad 13 were left a mystery although a couple of them we could ha we could hazard a pretty educated guess so in this video we're going to take a look at each of these characters individually there's not a huge amount to say i'm not expecting it to be the meatiest video ever but it's just a nice quick roundup of everything we know about the newest vice captains and i'm actually going to start with one of the characters who we did already know about and that's kione kotetsu the new vice captain of the fourth division you of course recognise this character as she has played a minimal role throughout the series as something of a tertiary supporting character, part of the duo that used to make up the 13th Division's third seat, along with Sentaro Kotsubaki, who is another character we'll be mentioning in this video later on. Kione takes the position as her sister Isane is promoted to captain after the death of Unohana during the war. And the fact that these two are sisters is interesting. We've obviously never really had a familial relationship like this at the very top of a division before, and I kind of like it. Um, but regarding Kione, you know, you kind of have to wonder why she didn't join her sister's division to begin with, um, and instead spent all of her time vying for that um, kind of position of favour with Ukitake fighting Kotsubaki for that. And I think the answer is just that. The two of them have had this kind of undying love and respect for Ukitake that she obviously didn't want to leave his side, but he is, of course, killed during the Thousand Year Blood War, much like Unohana. And I guess when Rukia took over the captaincy position there, Kione felt she could finally move on and decided instead to work with her sister. So that's kind of Kione's story. We still don't know anything about her Zan Park Toe, and when she shows up in New Breathes from Hell, she is actually impaled pretty quickly by a huge hell hollow. So her vice captaincy, at least what we see of it in the manga, doesn't start out too great. Moving on, we get possibly my favourite vice captain now, and one of the ones we could have hazarded a guess would take up the position, and that's the new vice captain of Squad 12, Akon, taking over from the deceased Nemu Kurotsuchi. I really do like Akon. I think he really shined in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. He's an example of a tertiary character, much like Kione, but really coming to the spotlight in that final arc of Bleach. Uh, I think he's more than earned this position now that Nemu is dead. I think... Akon and Mayuri really work well together and Akon's just such a great character to pair up with someone as eccentric as Mayuri and also um, he kind of bounces off well with characters like Kisuke as well because Akon's very much a straight man, he's very straight laced, very serious. Um, yes, he is kind of a mad scientist like the rest of them, but he's definitely not quite as quirky and weird as Mayuri and Kisuke. And you get to see that really play out in the Thousand Year Blood War when he's talking to Kisuke on the phone. And Kisuke's just kind of turning the whole situation into a joke and Akon's like freaking out that he's not taking it seriously. So lovely personality with Akon there. And I more than think he deserved this spot 
uh, as a vice captain. What kind of interests me, though, is in Chapter 685, we find out that Mayuri has created a new Nemu, Nemuri Hachigo, who is already well on her way to growing up, essentially, as she is, you know, not a, she's essentially an artificial being. She probably grows faster. Um, and so I kind of wonder if maybe when she gets to the original Nemu's age, would Mayuri replace Akon with Nemuri Hachigo? Because... Much like the last Nemu, she's kind of family in a weird sense. But I don't think he would do that. Like I said, I think the two of them work well together. And I think Mayuri has a sort of almost kind of respect for Akon, much in the same way as he has for his captain. Um, and I think Akon, like I said, has earned that spot. So I think what, what's more likely to happen is if she isn't already, which I seriously doubt it, um, Nemuri Hachigo will end up the third seat of the 12th Division when she's old enough. There was a bit of confusion when the new chapter came out. People thought that we were actually being treated to Akon Zan Puk To, but I'm pretty sure that is not the case. He just takes a vial of something off of his sash and uses almost like a sort of Quincy-esque spell, which I thought was really cool. Um, and actually, there's a nice little detail as well that around his neck, hanging from the sash, is where he keeps his new vice captain's badge. Um, very, very unique. And actually, looking at this new chapter of Bleach, Kubo has a bit of a trend now of putting vice captain's badges in slightly unorthodox places. So I kind of like that. And I think, like I said, Akon really suits the role. And then the last of the known characters to take up a vice captain's spot is Sentaro Kotsubaki, taking up the role of the vice captain of the 13th division under Rukia. As I mentioned earlier, he once vied for this kind of spot with his partner Kione Kotetsu when they both held the third seat under Ukitake, with neither of them stepping into the shoes of the deceased Kayen. Now, though, of course, time has really pressed on. The two of them survived the Quincy Blood War, and both of them were now rewarded with a vice captain's position, with Kotsubaki taking the one of the 13th Division where he was previously. This puts him more in line with his father, Jinemon Kotsubaki, who used to be the vice captain of the 7th Division under Aikawa Love. And actually, Kotsubaki really interests me because Kubo's given him a couple of slight design changes that, in my opinion, make him look really, really old. Like, he has aged up big time compared to a lot of these guys, but he actually looks kind of badass as well. I kind of appreciate... Um, him looking a little bit more world weary and it's kind of they've kind of dialed down the jokiness of these characters as well Kione and Sentaro basically were just used for comic relief in the past they did have a couple of moments where they weren't such as Ukitake's death where I think despite not really saying anything they were actually used very effectively to convey the grief that these people were feeling but now Sentaro and Kione can kind of step into the limelight a little more, I think, as vice captains, they'll probably be afforded more screen time. I'll tell that to someone like Chojiro. Um, but you have to assume that they will probably get slightly more time um, to really show what they can do. And Sentaro is another one who Zanpakuto we still don't actually know yet. So if there are going to be more chapters in the future, I would expect to see more of these guys. But moving on to the real meat of the video, to round out the new vice captain spots, we actually were treated to two brand new characters, the vice captain of the 7th division, Atau Rindo, and the vice captain of the 8th division, Yu Yu Yayahara, which is not the easiest name to say in the world. Starting off with the vice captain of the 7th division, and my favourite of the two by far, if I'm being completely honest, is Atau Rindo. And I think this guy is just really, really awesome. He has a great not kind of quite subtle design, but with enough elements that allow him to stand out from the crowd. But what's what's really awesome about this guy is he is deaf and he is mute. Um, and I think that's just really, really a, a really intriguing personality trait that Kubo has never really tackled before. But it's really awesome seeing him using sign language to commune with people, being able to read lips. It immediately makes him incredibly interesting, I think, but also shows you as well just how skilled he is as well, how perceptive he is. And I think that works really well to create this awesome dynamic that we've just never seen before in the series. What I like as well about Atau is I think Kubo's kind of doing something here about how... Yes, he can't 
properly, you know, he can't communicate in the normal way with his colleagues, but perhaps as a result of that, he is more in touch with nature than any of the other Shinigami. And we see this really cool moment when he's first introduced where he's just in the gardens of the 7th Division, surrounded by animals. Like, literally, they are all over him. And you get this cool kind of notion that, yeah, he like he loves nature. He really understands animals. You get the impression that maybe he feels like they understand him a little better. Um, but it's cool because you, you do kind of get the sense, presumably, hopefully, that the Gote 13 are sort of learning sign language, learning to help him interpret and work with him and stuff like that. So that's really cool. And I like I like an awful lot of things about Atau. I like how he doesn't embody the traditional 7th Division member. The 7th Division under Seijin Komamura was very masculine, very ultra-macho. Everyone was super manly. Iba's the head of the Shinigami Men's Association, and they're all themed around, like, these tough guy Yakuza types. Um, I really like that. And then Atau comes along, and he's definitely a little more sensitive, a little more gentle. Um, like I said, he's got that side of him that's very in tune with the natural world. And I think that works really, really well as a contrast with his new captain, Iba, who is still hyper-masculine, dresses like a Yakuza member. And you get that really cool moment where Iba sort of crashes in the first time we see Atau, and he's like, Oi, you know, what are you doing over here? You're supposed to be doing your job. I've got a message for you. And Atau sort of turns around. And he's like, you know, saying I've already heard it. And Iba kind of sheepishly is like, oh, yeah, sure. And I really like that. I thought that was honestly really cool. And again, another thing I really like about Atau and his existence within the 7th Division kind of is this existence of contrasts. It kind of reminds me in some ways of Yumichika among the 11th Division. Um, but, you know, Atau can't communicate in the sort of orthodox met way with the rest of his team, um, whereas the 7th Division were generally very known for being very straight talking, very forward. Um, Komamura, for instance, in the fake Karakura Town arc, made his intentions known immediately that he would side with the Visor, something that even took Shinji by surprise. So I just think that Atau is a really cool character and an awesome way for Kubo to explore new avenues with characters in the story. And I think he fits already very well into the Gote 13. And I actually can't help but wonder if he has had any interaction with Seijin since his, um, Seijin's, you know, disappearance, transformation into a, a full-on wolf, um, since he does love animals so much. Another thing I just think is so good about this character is how incredibly unique and awesome his Zan Park To is. So obviously, since he can't speak, he can't say a release command for his blade. So instead, he writes it on the blade and that actually activates it. I kind of wonder if that would work for every Shinigami or if it just works for him, because obviously his Zan Park To spirit is him. You know, they are one and the same. It's a part of his soul. It understands that he can't talk and therefore it responds to that. I don't, I somehow, I don't think that like Renji could just write Howl on his blade and it would work. Maybe it would. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so Atau's uh, release command is give birth. And what's really, again, awesome about this Zanpak To, I'm kind of gushing about this character, but I really think Kubo has done something awesome here. Like, um, you know, Atau feels like, just based on his design, he could have been part of the Gote the entire time. He doesn't really look like anyone else in the series. You know, he has shades of certain characters a little bit, but not enough where I saw him and I was like, that is, you know, Aizen. You know, there is there is a, there are a couple of characters in the series who have literally looked like Aizen at times. Um, but he looked perfectly unique, but also... Nice and understated as well, and I really enjoy that in character designs, with just enough about him where you can see him and think, oh yeah, I know who that is. Um, but without him looking so ridiculous, he could be like an anime-only filler character, for instance. But his Zanpak Toe, again, is just really cool. So basically he says, he writes Give Birth on the blade, and it transforms into a whip made up of like the Shikigami talismans, you know, the sort of paper talismans you see. And then... The Zanpak To doesn't seem to have a set name, which is really weird. That's like totally weird, really strange. And you kind of have to wonder what the spirit looks like. Um, my assumption would be it is something akin to the talismans you see in Shikai form, something that can be 
um, molded or changed to whatever Atal wants it to be, because we then see he writes the word hawk, um, presumably as the stand-in name for his Zanpok toe, and those talismans transform into birds in one of the most visually arresting scenes in the new chapter. And... I just love that. I think that looks so, so cool. And I imagine he can just do that with nearly any animal. I'm assuming it has to be an animal. Maybe he could Maybe he could write sword and the, they turn into loads of blades or something. I'm, ser- I'm doubting it personally. I think it's probably just animals. Um, but I think that's so... I think that's really, really cool. And then he sends the birds to attack one of the hell hollows and they just strip it to the bone. But it's just... That's such a unique idea. And I love this idea that he kind of has to, like, imprint something onto the blade to make it something else. And I think that's really, really cool. Um, I think it's, I think it's again, it kind of goes well with his character. Like, he's, again, quite understated. Um, and he almost gets to decide the impact his Zanpak Toe has. And I think Kubo has succeeded on pretty much every level so far with a Tao. The next character is Yu Yu Yayahara of the 8th Division. And... Immediately, she's definitely less my speed. Um, I've never really been into the super, super hyperactive, over-the-top characters who kind of come across as a little bit grating. At the same time, I'm still impressed that Kubo has come up with yet another totally unique character. We could look at her silhouette with the pigtails and the short skirt and think, that's Yayahara, it's no one else in the franchise, um, which I think is continually impressive. Yayahara is kind of an interesting character when you think about it. When you think about Bleach as a franchise, it ended in 2016. And social media and the internet were obviously a big thing back then. Um, you know, but I think they, are, they, they obviously weren't what they are now. And I think Yayahara is a character for like the modern age of, you know, like TikTok or whatever. All these kind of apps and things that I'm far too much of a doddery old man to understand properly. Um, but, you know, you see her, she's got this kind of, like, influencer vibe about her. The moment she sees Ichigo, she, like, although he's this revered war hero from the Thousand Year Blood War, she just, like, leaps in, snaps a selfie with him, and it's going straight onto her social media page. Um, she's trying to add him as a contact. That's kind of funny. That sort of dissonance, that um, disconnect between Ichigo, who is, you know for all intents and purposes, a little bit older in, in, in this uh, story arc. She com- definitely comes across as a newer generation Shinigami, and I like seeing that application of technology. And that's actually kind of interesting as well when you think about it, because obviously Yayahara must be quite young, I'm guessing, because she can like use a mobile phone, she's got social media accounts. Now, it is mentioned that she is obsessed with um, the human world, specifically the Gyaru uh, fashion subculture of Japan, which is something we'll get into in a sec. Um, But it's just kind of cool to see that contrast between Yayahara, who, you know, is completely fine with technology, and Rukia, who doesn't understand how video calling works. You know, she thinks that Orohime is on the other side of the phone, which is a great moment. Um, But I just think that that's kind of cool. And I don't think that Kubo's trying to make out that Rukia is really old or something, although obviously at this point in the story, she is a bit older. Um, I do think that Yayahara is supposed to be a character, you know, a new character for a new era of Bleach, essentially. And so, because of that, I have to hand it to her as well. She's not really a personality type we've ever seen before. Um, You know, there are a couple of characters in the series who are that kind of over-the-top, hyperactive um, character, but never someone with such a... um, proclivity for things like social media, these human world things that she's really adopted. And I think that's kind of neat. And as I mentioned, she does have a unique design. She's obsessed with the Japanese uh, fashion subculture of Gyaru to the point where she's tanned her skin and changed her hair color. And of course, that does make her stand out among the rest of the Gote 13. And you know what? I I think it fits. I I can see Lisa turning the 8th, once she's got control of the 8th division, I can see her transforming it into this kind of all-girl, pop culture obsessed team Um, that's very much kind of what Lisa was like as well, Lisa was interesting in that she kind of like hid it a bit, but you know she had that really weird kind of quirky side to her, and you know you can just kind of totally, you can totally see it 
spreading through the eighth division. Yaya Hara's wearing similarly short skirt cropped Shihaku show, much like her captain. I think Kyoraku would be pretty pleased <laughs> with how it turned out in the end, um, even though he's now kind of got a put on a front of a mature Captain Commander. I think he's probably pretty happy with how it turned out. And much like Atau, um, and it's actually briefly just jumping back to him, it's kind of cool that Kubo didn't make us wait at all for his Zanpak Toe. Um, so it's kind of weird that we know his Zanpak Toe and we still don't know his captains. Like we've seen Iba's Shikai on numerous occasions. We have no idea what it's called and no idea what it does, if anything. It might just be a blade change. Um, but... You know, we, it's nice that we found out Atal's powers immediately. Yaya Hara's a little bit weirder, a little bit more abstract. So basically, she gets her hands, you know, like a mouth, like jaws, and she manifests like this massive bear behind her and then clamps down on enemies, and presumably the bear takes a massive bite out of them. It's difficult to see in the short time we spend with her, whether or not this bear is something that everyone else can see, or if it was just done for, you know, our benefit, essentially. Um, or it could just be, you know, a manifestation of her Reiatsu. But it is really cool because it seems pretty powerful. She just clamps down on the hollow and a part of its body is just ripped away. Um, now, I do kind of wonder what's the deal with this, because we've never, never really seen anything too much like this before. And, you know, I've seen a lot of theories floating around. You know, does she have some kind of relation to the Beast Clan, you know, much like Komamura? But I think that's pretty unlikely, because she looks completely like a human, unlike Komamura, obviously. Even when he became a human, he still had animal-like elements, like his ears and stuff. She just looks like a human, so personally I don't think that's what it is. A theory I have, and I, I don't know if it's shared or not, is that I think maybe there's a chance she could already be in Shikai by the time we see her and her fingernails, because there does seem to be some an element of emphasis on the fingernails are her Shikai. Like, you can imagine her activating her blade and it just transforms into these nails of hers, um, which she then uses to clamp down on enemies. I think that's a possibility. Regardless, I'm honestly pretty intrigued to find out more. I don't really care for her personality that much, but I do think her design is nice and unique. She fits perfectly well within the 8th Division and, to be honest, within the rest of the Gote 13. I can kind of imagine a scenario in the future where we're having this like super serious captain's meeting and Yayahara maybe gets like a, a notification on her mobile or something in her pocket and it goes off really loudly and Kyoraku just sort of, everyone just sort of stops and she's like, you know, my bad. But then she like answers the phone. I can totally see something like that in the future. That would be, I could really see that. And, um, you know, you can almost imagine as well, like someone says to Lisa, like, can you, you know, reprimand her? And Lisa's like checking the notifications as well. I can totally imagine that in the future. So I think, although I'm not a huge fan of her immediately, I think she fits really nicely. And so that's it. We now know the whole slate of vice captains, thanks to Kubo, who really took no time at all to just get that out of the way in the newest chapter. And I I love that approach. I'm all for that. Please keep answering our questions. Um, I think that's awesome. And I, I, I'm perfectly happy with the vice captains. I think Kione and Sentaro splitting up to become actual vice captains makes a lot of sense. Akon completely deserves it. Um, characters that we didn't really mention in this video because they're they, we know a lot about them. Ikaku obviously deserves his position as the 11th Division vice captain. I think it's really cool to see him there. And yeah, I just think overall I'm really happy with the way Kubo has done this. The two new characters prove that he can still knock it out of the park when it comes to unique character designs. It makes me really excited. If, if we hopefully get another chapter in the future, I'd love to see more of them. And yeah, overall, I'm just really happy with this. So that's it for this video, guys. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the brand new vice captains. I'm speaking of Atau Rindo and Yu Yu Yayahara. Um, which one of those two is your favourite at the moment? And of course, what do you think of just the whole slate of vice captains as we see them now? How powerful do you reckon this group is? Because I remember when 685 rolled around, the actual current set of captains took a bit of a bashing from the fan base as presumably the weakest Gote 13 we've seen in some time, despite characters like Kenpachi and Kyoraku being among them. 
I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what you think about the current slate of vice captains as well. Because I think characters like... Well, I'm, I'm kind of biased, but I think Akon could be a real asset to the vice captains. Um, but yeah, let me know in the comments below what you think, guys. Which one is your favourite between Atau and Yu Yu? And also let me know who your favourite vice captain is in general. I'd love to hear it. Don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, guys, I'll catch you later. See ya.